Welcome to Get the Facts. My name is Suzanne Bernier Robinson. Today we are going to be learning about the Greater Dairy Public Health Network. Our guest today is Garrett Simonson. Well, thank you for uh, having me back to uh, talk about uh, the Public Health Network and, mm -hmm. and my role here in the town and uh, the Greater Dairy region. Mm -hmm. Uh, so my name is Garrett Simonson. I'm uh, a member of the Town of Derry's Health Department. Um, my title is Public Health Network Coordinator, uh, but my role in the Health Department is to facilitate uh, planning for public health emergencies. Okay, you put it so simply, but there <laughs> is so much that you do. So um, first, uh, who do you re represent? It's a certain region. Okay, so. Uh, in New Hampshire, taking a step back and, and talking a little bit about public health service delivery. Uh, in New Hampshire, the majority of public health services are delivered or provided by the state health department. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple of exceptions to that rule. Uh, the Manchester Health Department and the Nashua Health Department provide a full complement of public health services similar to the state health department. Mm -hmm. um, so at the state level, uh, they conduct uh, and monitor uh, infectious disease. Uh, they do uh, food safety uh, in, the, in the state. Um, and over time, what the state health department has looked toward is the delivery of additional public health services on a regional basis. Mm -hmm. uh, so the state health department has designated 13 uh, public health regions across New Hampshire. Uh, the town of Derry serves as the host and the fiscal agent for those regional, for that regional initiative okay. uh, here in the greater Derry region, mm -hmm. uh, which includes 10 towns. Okay. Uh, so Atkinson, Chester, Danville, Derry, Hampstead, Londonderry, Plastow, Salem, Sandown, and Wyndham okay. are all part of mm -hmm. this regional uh, initiative. So a combined population of just about 138,000 people. Oh, wow. Okay, so that's quite an area. Yes. Is there a plan, a specific regional plan that you work from that may be different than the others, or are all the regions um, working together? So, so all of the regions are tasked with the responsibility of developing a regional public health emergency response plan. Um, and generally that response plan includes uh, several components. Uh, the first is to have multi-agency uh, coordination. So mm -hmm. in a, a local community, you might have a local emergency operations center uh, or an EOC that coordinates uh, the emergency response locally. Mm -hmm. uh, for a public health emergency, uh, we utilize uh, multi-agency coordination across okay. healthcare, public health, uh, uh, safety, mm -hmm. uh, to coordinate the public health resources and information uh, of that event. The regional response plans also include uh, plans for uh, countermeasure dispensing. So if the emergency required that we offer a vaccination service or uh, perhaps dispense medication to the public, uh, we have plans for sites that we can open uh, that the public okay. can come to to receive vaccines or uh, medications if the emergency requires it. Mm -hmm. And then we also do planning for uh, medical surge events. If uh, the hospital experienced a surge of patients that overwhelmed that facility mm -hmm. um, or the healthcare system, uh, that we have a community-based option for uh, diverting patients from the hospital where we can provide yeah. some sort of medical care mm -hmm. uh, to the public. Okay, and so um, you gave us a couple of examples. Sure. Um, the dispensing of medication, um, the uh, like the flu shots that we had talked about on an earlier show. Um, what are some of the other reasons that we would have need of a plan like that? Are there other situations that would? Well, certainly the, the ones that we're most familiar with are weather events. Uh, so the natural oh, events that- I hadn't that, actually thought of, that makes sense. Yep. It hadn't crossed my mind though. <laughs> um, so, so sheltering right. mm. uh, ends up being a response that we're uh, very okay. familiar with. And, mm. and you know, arguably any emergency or disaster event has a public health component. Yeah, um, yeah. So while setting up mm -hmm. a, a shelter for overnight stays may not uh, seem like a true public health emergency or that there's a natural connection, right. we certainly have public health concerns related to that. Exactly. You know, being able to mm -hmm. control the uh, possibility that there might be a secondary emergency with an infectious disease outbreak mm -hmm. in a shelter mm -hmm. um, is a public health concern. Okay. Or 
being able to provide um, services to individuals who might have a, a functional or a medical need uh, that they come to the shelter with mm -hmm. um, is, is certainly a, an example. Um, so mm -hmm. we have the most experience with uh, naturally occurring events uh, like uh, a weather event. Right. Um, but we're certainly, uh, a lot of the planning is really focused on uh, infectious disease scenarios. Okay. Um, a naturally occurring example is influenza. Um, mm -hmm. it, it occurs naturally. Uh, but we're also concerned about infectious disease scenarios related to uh, man-made events or mm -hmm. uh, events that uh, an individual might be looking to cause harm, uh, such as bioterrorism. Okay. When we do the planning, uh, we generally would, would do a, a threat assessment. Um, uh, to begin with, to determine. So that's before you start the, that's the first step of the planning right. stage. Right, you know, to, okay. to first fully understand what, what threats are present within a, a, a community mm -hmm. and what is that community's risk level okay. to, that, uh, okay. to that threat. Um, and so when we do threat assessments, we generally look at a, at, at a couple of things. Uh, one, what is the probability of that threat? Is it a high probability or a lower mm -hmm. probability? And two, what would the impact of that event uh, or that threat be on the community? So while bioterrorism may be a lower probability for an area like uh, Greater Dairy or Dairy, um, the impact that it could have on that community is very substantial. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we talk about bioterrorism um, and think about the planning for that, uh, certainly the probability uh, factors into our thought process. You know, that's probably a higher probability that it's going to occur mm -hmm. in a more urban environment, say New York City, right. uh, Boston, those tend to be mm -hmm. uh, what we think of when we think of uh, the threat of bioterrorism. Right. Right. Um, you know, with that said, our region has a very high uh, commuter population into uh, greater Boston. Mm -hmm. um, so the planning that we do is also thoughtful uh, around that uh, scenario as well, that an event could occur outside of our region but still impact a significant number of our residents. Right. Um, so right. the planning that we, Back. yep, so mm -hmm. the planning that we do has to factor that in, in into play as well. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about identifying um, medical facilities or areas where you would have an overflow of, of patients or um, do you have a need for volunteers? How do you get everybody on board to carry out sure. one of these plans? So uh, first and foremost is through the planning process. So we, through a planning process, we wanna make sure that we're engaging uh, multiple jurisdictions. Uh, the, the other thing about a public health threat is it really doesn't know boundaries mm -hmm. uh, the way other emergencies might. Um, so we wanna be thoughtful and make sure that we're uh, planning across the jurisdictions, but also planning across uh, community sectors or partner agencies mm -hmm. so that we're involving the whole community in uh, finding the solutions on how we provide the services. And when you're saying community, are you talking about like the um, the dairy community, if something was uh, happening here in dairy or the the region? I mean, I guess so. It so it's really it's really both. You know, okay. we've we've seen uh, events here in dairy. We had um, going back prior to to uh, me being in this position, we had uh, a hepatitis A outbreak mm -hmm. in uh, in a food uh, establishment here in dairy, um, and that response uh, pulled in partners from uh, the state health department. Um, it pulled in partners from other towns to help okay. provide uh, the vaccination mm -hmm. service to protect against that. And I guess it's so important to pull those agencies in as quick as you can to prevent um, the spread or any other. Um, right, and, and the response often involves you know, a lot of uh, responders and volunteers to, to provide that service, mm -hmm. um, you know, from uh, greeting them uh, to uh, you know, screening to, to see if they've been impacted by the event, if they have any uh, medical allergies um, uh, to vaccines or, or to medications that might be dispensed, to uh, re going through a registration process, having people complete forms to the actual dispensing. So when we do uh, a, a public health operation, it, it really involves a, a large number of people and, a, uh, and many agencies to make it happen.
Right. It sounds like there's a lot more than this situation has arise. All right, let's just go over to the local high school. That's where they're treating us or for the situation or, or if it's um, a shelter. Right. Um, but it's a lot more than that. I'm sure you've got to track how many people that have entered and, and what they've been treated for. I mean, there, there's so much more. I, I really never thought um, yeah, so, so it begins, oh. it certainly begins with the planning process. Mm -hmm. um, and then that planning process moves into training uh, the staff and volunteers who would provide the service, okay. right. ultimately leads into conducting exercises right. to validate the training that they've received and to Where you can improve, uh, measure can the change. effectiveness of the plans. Wow, okay. So um, and then it ultimately results uh, after exercising into developing improvement plans. How do we improve the plan that we have in place um, and retrain the staff to that improved plan and then exercise it again. Um, so it's, it's really a, a, an endless quality improvement circle mm -hmm. that we go through mm -hmm. um, to do this work. Right, right. it really sounds like um, that a lot of practice need or, or changes occur along the way and um, that it's critical that those exercises are done. So you just finished doing one, didn't you, a, a couple weeks ago? Yes. The uh, low flow oxygen. Setup exercise. Setup. Okay, yep. so, <laughs> there was a little bit more. <laughs> so during school vacation week, we actually uh, took over West Running Brook Middle School for mm -hmm. uh, a day and uh, came in with about 45 uh, pers staff and volunteers, um, including uh, a number of nursing students. Um, and the purpose of that exercise uh, was to demonstrate the ability to set up what's called an alternate care site. Um, and the, the purpose of an alternate care site is uh, to uh, address a medical surge event that might occur at the hospital or within the healthcare system. So if the hospital has a surge of patients mm -hmm. um, and they can no longer maintain uh, patient care within that facility, uh, that we have a community-based option to take the lower acuity patients, the non-critical patients, mm -hmm. uh, off of the hospital uh, so that they can uh, focus their attention on the critical, uh, okay. the patients who require right. critical care. Right. Um, so the specific focus of this exercise was to set up a number of patient beds um, in the school gym mm -hmm. and to then set up uh, oxygen that could be provided to those patients. Uh, beds. Okay, yeah. so you said 45 people you had involved in that training. Yeah. How many were medical staff? How many volunteers? And so, so it re was really a good good mix. And going back to um, our earlier conversation about uh, the role of multiple partner agencies, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it involved uh, representatives from Parkland Medical Center. We had uh, respiratory therapists uh, from there who. Uh, basically helped in setting up the oxygen equipment. Um, we also had uh, an oxygen vendor, uh, so a, a home health agency that mm -hmm. you know routinely is out in the community uh, helping an individual set up their oxygen within mm -hmm. the home. Uh, mm -hmm. They participated in the exercise. Um, I mentioned that we had uh, nursing students involved. Um, we utilized the nursing students um, and actually Boy Scouts, local Boy Scouts, oh. to come in and help us set up all of the cots in the gym. Uh, so we set up about 37 uh, cots, which would be used as, mm -hmm. as the patient beds. So again, that's something that people don't realize or even think of, that, um, that those measures need to be in place. So if something does happen, that the beds are there if it's for a shelter. Right. Somebody's gonna be responsible to know that, okay, these need to be set up. It's gonna be a shelter tonight. We've got the, a flooding flood going on or whatever the natural disaster may be. But right. um, the, the plans are important, yeah. but the relationships yeah. are really mm -hmm. where the value is. How many organizations uh, within the dairy area do you have um, relationships built? So, so what we, attempt to do in the planning process is uh, to utilize um, the Centers for Disease Control, or CDC, mm -hmm. um, has uh, a community sector model um, that focuses on pulling uh, representatives from various community sectors, from uh, sc schools and childcare facilities to faith-based organizations to mm -hmm. agencies that serve uh, the elderly um, to fire police um, and healthcare. Um, so we 
we try to utilize that model both in planning, training, mm -hmm. exercise, and ultimately in response um, so that um, it, it really helps to create a continuity of care um, within the community during a response event. Mm -hmm. How often are you doing exercises like this? So exercises are really driven by federal and state requirements uh, okay. for us. Okay. Um, so each year, um, uh, usually starting July 1, is when we find out what our exercise requirements are going to be for, uh, for that uh, July 1 to June 30th mm -hmm. uh, fiscal year. Mm -hmm. um, generally, there's um, notification exercise requirements, so we're required uh, by uh, CDC and the state health department to do uh, four notification exercises every year. Okay, and the um, notification, is that just to get it out to the general public? Um, usually okay. it's notification to uh, the staff and the volunteers who would oh, work okay. uh, within these response facilities. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and we're required to do a site activation and facility setup exercise every mm -hmm. year. Um, just so one? Just one, okay. yep. Um, and so th uh, this low flow oxygen exercise mm -hmm. uh, that we completed in February uh, meets our exercise requirement for this year. Okay. Um, and so uh, we're golden for the rest of the year and until the start of the next year. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever choose to do more than one exercise? Because um, I think everyone, every exercise you do is going to be a little bit different. Right. And, you know, sometimes uh, we get a surprise and we have an actual event um, that occurs mm -hmm. within, um, within the year as well. And so um, last year we uh, had a hepatitis C outbreak uh, that uh, triggered a response uh, for us. And we actually can utilize actual responses to count uh, toward our exercise requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes we complete an exercise and then have an actual response that we're able to use um, as an opportunity to further validate the plans um, that we have in place. Mm -hmm. So we use those events to, those actual events, to develop improvement plans as well. Mm -hmm. Do you, and so you're responsible for nine other towns plus dairy, yep. 10. And um, so how often are you in those other towns and what are you doing in those towns? Um, the exercise you conducted was here in Derry, um, but what is your involvement in the other towns? So for the region, uh, we've identified and designated uh, facilities around the region that could serve these purposes, okay. the purpose mm -hmm. um, of setting up and dispensing uh, medications or administering vaccines. Um, so we have designated facilities uh, a designated facility here in Derry, uh, designated facilities in Salem and Plastow as well uh, for uh, these purposes. So I work uh, across the region with uh, all of the communities really mm -hmm. to help enhance their planning. Mm -hmm. uh, the regional response plan is accessible to each and every town in this region. Uh, the communities can ask uh, for public health assistance um, at any time. Um, as can our healthcare partners. Mm -hmm. um, and the state also has the ability to ask uh, for our assistance uh, by asking us to activate a response here in the region, but also by asking us to help out other regions. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not uncommon for me uh, to be pulled into another region to uh, help, help them uh, mm -hmm. in an emergency as well. Mm -hmm. So the exercise you chose to do here, the low flow oxygen um, function exercise, uh, the other regions were working on different exercises that they chose. So they actually had the same exercise oh, requirements. So, did. so okay. all 13 regions in the state. Uh, this is this is actually uh, a uh, a coordinated priority for uh, the state health department. Uh, the, these exercises. Mm -hmm. So there are specific exercises that they tell you you need to. I guess I was thinking it was a list that you get to choose. Yeah, there, there, is, there is some flexibility. Okay. Um, this year there were, uh, there were more specific criteria that we had to follow. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. In some years we have some flexibility to you know, decide, um, you know, this year we're going to uh, exercise vaccine dispensing mm -hmm. um, at, in, in Plast Hour in Salem. Mm -hmm. um, but this year it was a, a much more prescribed uh, requirement okay. that we had. Okay, so there's that continuity within the state, which right. is nice to know. Right. 
um, that from one region to another, you can expect the same responses. Yes. Oh, good. Um, so what do you have for support staff? So within the uh, health department, so uh, Dairy Health Department uh, has a, a health officer, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Raich, who um, conducts the food and restaurant inspections. Uh, earlier I mentioned that um, you know, the state health department delivers the majority of public health services. Dairy is uh, considered to be a self-inspecting community in that uh, the state health department doesn't conduct our food and restaurant uh, inspections. We have a local health officer okay. who has the authority to do that. Um, we have a part-time ad admin support uh, staff mm -hmm. uh, within the health department. Um, one of the other regional initiatives in addition to preparedness planning that we have uh, in our region is um, a substance misuse prevention mm -hmm. coordinator mm -hmm. um, who works uh, in sort of a similar fashion in coordinating with uh, the 10 towns and and the uh, partner agencies or community sectors within our region uh, to address uh, substance misuse. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have a part-time uh, volunteer coordinator. Um, so within uh, the public health network, we have what's called the Medical Reserve Corps. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a group of largely uh, clinicians, uh, but some non-clinicians mm -hmm. um, who volunteer to help out to provide clinical support um, in, and, in the emergency mm -hmm. response. And do these volunteers um, need to have any experience? So uh, for the clinical staff, uh, you know, generally they have, have to have a valid uh, active mm -hmm. clinical license. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some retired clinicians in the group. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, so for certain uh, clinical interactions like administering a vaccine, there's obviously only certain mm -hmm. clinicians that can do that. Right. Um, we wouldn't be utilizing non-clinicians mm -hmm. in that way. Uh, but the non-clinical uh, volunteers are uh, equally as important because there's uh, many functions uh, that we need for them to uh, perform in the, form, in the way of registration even before they get to right. see a vaccinator. Right. Now that you mentioned it, I'm thinking much more in depth where you need the setup, you need someone right. registering, you need someone to confirm things have been done. So, right. there's so it's so much larger than I even envisioned. So if we have a viewer that wants to um, become, a, you said the Medical Reserve Corps, if they feel they qualify as a clinician or um, as a volunteer, do you have that contact information? Certainly, they, they can contact uh, me directly. My uh, phone number is 603-845-5539, uh, mm -hmm. or they can reach me by email, uh, which mm -hmm. is Garrett Simonson at dairynh.org. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, if they visit the town's website um, and go to the mm -hmm. health department's website, uh, my contact information is okay. there as well. Great. Um, is there anything else that we may have missed or that's... You know, I, th I think that the, the most important um, message, particularly to the public, is that um, we're very fortunate in, uh, in this town, but in, in this region and, and really in New Hampshire, um, that there is such a coordinated effort uh, to focus mm -hmm. on, on these issues. Um, and that certainly we would encourage uh, the public uh, to individually and within their own household or family take personal actions to prepare as well. Um, oh. Because a community's ability to, to respond is really, uh, to respond and recover to mm -hmm. an event is really uh, best when not only the public sector uh, is taking steps, but the private sector and the public themselves are taking steps to be prepared. So, so give me those steps. Yep, so <laughs> certainly uh, being prepared to uh, stay in place or shelter in their home uh, for a period of time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we generally recommend that people have provisions for themselves and their family for at least three days okay. um, minimum. Mm -hmm. um, being prepared to leave or evacuate your home um, if you need to. Mm -hmm. um, so having a go bag uh, packed and ready to go. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, having a communication plan, knowing how you're going to uh, talk with your family, uh, your loved ones, letting them know that you're safe, uh, having a meeting place uh, where you can meet uh, mm -hmm. if you need to leave. Mm -hmm. um, so really it's, it's about uh, being prepared to stay, leave, or connect. Mm -hmm. um, those are the three simple words that uh, I try to convey to people. Okay. Um, having a plan to stay at home, 
for a period of time, mm -hmm. leave at a moment's notice, or connect with your loved ones. Mm -hmm. Is there a site people can visit uh, that has like a list of, okay, you know, maybe these are things that you need to uh, be prepared to take with you if you go? Um, so uh, certainly we have a, a brochure um, okay. that uh, the Public Health Network ut utilizes. Um, mm -hmm. If people contact me, we'll gladly send that out to them. Right. Um, and it's, it's also on the website um, if they visit the, the town's website. Okay. Um, I think that would be helpful because yes. it, it sounds overwhelming as far as, okay, well, what would I take? And at a moment's notice, what do I want to pack? Um, and have in there that if there was a list that you could just check off. Yeah, we, we have a very simple uh, list that spells it, spells oh, it out great. in that way okay. of, you know, if you need to stay at home, if you need to leave, and, Wonderful. and a okay. little card that you can complete and put in your wallet or your mm -hmm. handbag um, that has important contact oh, information. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay, I'm a list person, so yep. <laughs> for me to work through this, it would be much easier if I knew I had a little list to check off. And well, and, and the other thing that I think is important to, to say is that um, it can feel intimidating. Mm -hmm. and, and the reality is that many of us have uh, practical experience with what it what it means mm -hmm. to stay at home for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the number of the weather events. Well, especially up here, yeah. Right, uh, <laughs> certainly give us exposure with that. Mm -hmm. We may have never really truly experienced evacuation and, you know, a big scale. Right. Um, but we, we do have experience with, um, you know, leaving our home for a period of time. You know, we've mm -hmm. got experience with what it means to go on vacation mm -hmm. um, and pack a bag and have some, uh, have what we need uh, when we're going to be away from home mm -hmm. for a period of time. I think part of it is we all feel like we're so connected. W what do we need a, a plan for connection? We'll just pick up our cell phone. Right. But sometimes Reality those communication that... lines are down. So that brochure is great. I, th I think I'll be picking one up. Great. Um, but that's wonderful. You gave us all the information that if someone wants to get one, they can email or visit the town website. Certainly. Um, really, really valuable stuff. So I'm, I'm thankful that you mentioned that. I hope you've enjoyed and learned a lot about the Greater Dairy Health Public Network. Once again, my name is Suzanne Bernier-Robinson. Thank you for watching Get the Facts.